Hello everyone. Thanks so much for joining us today. I'm Karen Siegel. I'm one of the doctors on the yellow team at Crowfoot Village Family Practice. Today we're going to be talking about advanced care planning. This is a really important topic and can be a hard topic for some people. We get to my colleagues who will be speaking today. Please say hello to Dr. Julie Croteau. Julie, can you say something? Hi everyone, um, I'm one of the docs on Gold Team at Crowfoot and I'm really excited for our presentation today. Thanks, Julie. Uh, next we have Dr. Yen Yu. Yen? Hello everybody, I'm one of the doctors on Silver Team. Great, thank you. And now we have my fabulous new practice partner, Dr. Aaron Gore Hickman. Hi everyone, uh, good to see everyone. I'm glad you're here to talk about this important topic. Also on Yellow Team with Dr. Siegel, we make a pretty good team if I do say so myself. <laughs> Thanks Aaron, and we've got Dr. Ian Johnson. Hello, so I'm one of the docs on Blue Team and I'm very glad to be talking to you about advanced care planning in your living room rather than in the hospital where I normally have had to do this in the past. So much better place to talk about it. Very good point, Ian, thank you. And last but not least, Dr. Lynn Gillis. Hi, everybody. Oh, is that working? Yep, you're on, Lynn. Okay, hi, everybody. I'm one of the docs on Blue Team. And as everybody has said, I concur, this is a valuable topic to be talking about and glad we can bring this to you today. Back to Karen, Dr. Rick. Thanks, Lynn. Um, I'd like to say also that on our YouTube channel, uh, I believe we have Dr. Dr. Karen Richardson, who is answering questions. With anything that comes in. Uh, finally, I'd like to thank our IT expert, Meredith, for setting up and running the session for us, uh, especially because we are all joining from different locations. So that's no small feat. Um, before we get started, a bit of housekeeping. So you can post questions, as I said, uh, on the right hand side of the YouTube screen, there's a chat box. Uh, but please remember, this is a public session. So don't go posting um, personal medical questions. You can save your personal medical questions for your team at Crowfoot. Uh, we are indeed open and can certainly receive questions from you. So I'm going to introduce our topic today. And Meredith, could you start the um, Slideshow, please. Great, can you go back to the first one? That would be great. Thanks, okay. So just pop over to the next one. So, all right, so what is advanced care planning? So advanced care planning is a process of thinking about and sharing your wishes for future health and personal care. So this is something that you would think about yourself, uh, have, probably have a discussion with your loved ones about, um, and then have a, have a conversation also with your medical team about this. And helps your loved ones carry out your health and personal wishes. And now I'm going to pass it over to Dr. Lynn Gillis to get into a few more details. Could you go to the next slide, please, Meredith? Okay, so let's first just... Um quickly review why we are talking about this today. So I just wanted to say first and foremost, advanced care planning is important at all times and is something we should really be thinking about um, when we are well in order to ensure that our health care wishes and our values are followed in the event that we become seriously unwell. Unfortunately, of course, this can happen unexpectedly. So it's important to plan ahead. The current situation with the COVID pandemic certainly has a lot of people wondering and worried about what if I get sick with COVID-19? How will this affect me? What kind of care will I get? Um, or will I be provided if I'm sick and taken to hospital? This naturally leads to thoughts about what would you want to happen if you presented to hospital or became very sick at home? And even would you even want to go to hospital? So most people that get COVID will have mild symptoms that they can monitor in their own home. However, some will have severe illness and preparation for the unexpected uh, is really both wise and valuable. Talking about it now can give, as Dr. Siegel said, your family members peace of mind in knowing that your wishes are known and will be followed as much as possible 
uh, should you become seriously unwell. So the next um, piece that I want to address is what does advanced care planning look like in Alberta? So next slide, please, Meredith. Um, so important to just um, keep in mind that advanced care planning actually looks and sounds a little bit different depending on uh, where you are. So it can be different from country to country and it's even different province to province within Canada. So we're going to be using terms today that are specific to Alberta. And that's important for you to know if you have family members in other provinces that um, we or you may use some terms that aren't completely familiar to them. Um, so in Alberta, we have um, in a way two major components to our advanced care planning. We have the personal directive, uh, which one of our docs today is going to talk about in more detail. And we have goals of care, which another one of our docs will address. Um, so just a really brief um, introduction is that the personal directive is a written document that outlines your health and your personal care wishes, um, should you become too unwell to make decisions for yourself. And keep in mind, it's not a financial directive, it's specific to your health and your personal care wishes. It does not require you to have a lawyer and it is very different than the Alberta power of attorney, which is all around financial wishes and money matters as opposed to um, the personal directive that is really about your health and your care. Um, so in Alberta, the, the um, personal directive, you name somebody that you trust to speak on your behalf um, should you become unwell. Um, and that person in Alberta is called your agent. That is a term that is different in different provinces. So for example, in BC, that person is called your representative. So we're talking about Alberta. So we're talking about a personal directive with an agent. Um, so um, the second piece of uh, advanced care planning refers to um, goals of care. And I believe there's only two provinces that actually use uh, goals of care the way we do. So that term and, and that will be laid out in more detail um, to all of you watching by Dr. Johnson. Um, so, um, the goals of care section is um, a medical order written by your doctor or your nurse practitioner after talking with you. Um, it lets healthcare providers know the types of medical interventions you're willing to undergo, um, as well as should you become seriously uh, unwell and be unable to speak for yourself. Um, so in, uh, the last important piece for Alberta is that your personal directive and your goals of care um, should be kept in what we call a green sleeve. And that's a plastic holder that you can keep near or on your fridge in your home. And the reason we suggest this is because if a healthcare provider comes into your home, such as EMS um, or paramedics, they actually know in Alberta to go to that area in your home and look for your advanced care planning uh, documentation. And this, of course, allows them to quickly know what your healthcare wishes are and any interventions you're accepting of if you are in a situation where they can't ask you that directly. So now I'm going to hand it over to Dr. Johnston to describe um, goals of care in more detail. Thanks, Lynn. Can we have the next slide, please? So um, essentially, like Lynn was saying, this is a consistent way of describing what you want your healthcare team to do. It's only really necessary when things are going wrong. Uh, a personal directive may be helpful at any time, but a goal, the goals of care are more helpful when things are beginning to go wrong. And it's used across the province. So I've worked in uh, High Level, I've worked in Pincher Creek, and it's the same thing as it is in Calgary. So docs across the province know exactly what we're talking about when we use this. And although it is different from province to province, if you turn up to a healthcare facility in a different province with your green sleeve it'll be useful they'll still know what it means it's, it's very clear what it means uh, but the, you're, if you're talking to your relatives elsewhere they might not necessarily understand it I would just add to what Lynn said that um, it's a living will but it's not a will I often have conversations with patients where they said to me oh don't worry doc I've already done that I've got my will 
I, I usually say wills are for the dead and we prefer to look after the living. Uh, so wills are only useful when you're dead. These are separate things uh, that are, are very important to, to think about. Uh, next slide, please. So we talk about goals of care in terms of three categories, R, which is resuscitation, M, which is medical care, and C, which is more comfort care. And there's different definitions of various different things throughout that, which I'm gonna try and simplify and give you some examples for. An important thing to remember is that if you don't do a goal of care, then the default is R1, which is we throw the book at you. We do absolutely everything physically possible to bring you back from the brink if that's where you end up. And that might not be what you want when you think about all of the uh, health problems that you may have, or if you're in your later years, you might not want us to do all of those things. So if you don't, then it's important to make sure your goals of care are documented in that green sleeve, and we can help you do that at Crowfoot. If you don't do it, it's absolutely gonna be discussed at the front door of the hospital. Now, I've been that guy. I was that guy for a lot of time in Scotland. And that's another thing to mention, the different, um, things. This is a very clear way of helping people understand what their care wishes are. In Scotland, it was all or nothing. It was a do not resuscitate or just resuscitate. Whereas this is much more nuanced. It's much more um, uh, fleshed out. And I think that's excellent because not everybody wants everything done, but they might want some of it done depending on what uh, things are wrong with them. So I think that's an important thing to think about. So because it's going to be discussed at the front door of the hospital, I've been that guy and I'm, it's, I'm looking at you on your worst day. I'm looking at you having a really bad day. Whereas if you can have that conversation within us uh, in, on a good day, we understand you, we understand your wishes, we understand your problems, and we can have that conversation about on a good day rather than, oh, you're not looking too, too, too great, Mrs. Schmoo. And it, it does paint the pictures that people will sometimes do. So it's important to think about that. That's why we'd much rather that people think about it, talk about it with their family doctor in advance. Now, going on through this slide, R1, which is the, the green line at the top, involves everything. So if your heart was to stop beating or your lungs were to stop breathing, we're gonna try and take over that for you. We're gonna do chest compressions. We're gonna put in breathing tubes. We might have to administer shocks. I've, um, do aggressive things to try and get uh, a needle into a vein to try and give you drugs. This is barbaric. I'm not going to mince my words here. It is a very, very, very unpleasant experience. And you should know that this is you're dead and we're trying to bring you back to life. It is a big deal. R2, we take all those chest compressions and shocks off the table, but maybe if you got, the example I usually think of is if you've got a really bad pneumonia, so COVID would qualify as that, and you're not getting enough oxygen to supply your brain and your heart and, your, and the rest of your body, we need to stick a breathing tube into your mouth to help you to, to continue getting enough oxygen. The important thing to think about is not, would I, would I like someone to do that? It's what if it doesn't work? Because if it doesn't work, it means dying on a ventilator. Again, that's pretty blunt, but that's important to think about. Would you be willing to die on a ventilator? Because if so, then maybe, maybe our, our two goals of care with intubation is reasonable for you. If you say, no, no doc, I don't like the sound of that breathing tube. I'd, I'd rather not have that. The next step down is what we call our three goals of care, which is still going to the intensive care unit, where we can do other things. And so the example I often use with that is say you get a really bad urinary infection, a bad waterworks infection, and we're doing everything we can with giving you lots of antibiotics and fluids, but your blood pressure is very low and we need to do aggressive things to try and prop that up. That involves things like central lines, arterial lines. It's very in invasive and you're very sick if you're in that situation, things are not going well. And the question is again, if it doesn't go well, would you like to end your days in that circumstance or would you prefer to be in a more comfortable situation? So that's intensive care. Everything below that is honestly what majority of hospital care is. M1 goals of care takes chest compressions and 
breathing tubes and intensive care units with uh, fancy machines all off the table, but we still do everything else. We do chest x-rays and IV antibiotics and oxygen and all of that stuff, the sort of general stuff I was doing every day when I worked in hospital. And that's probably where most of you will be sitting um, if you're dealing with chronic disease, if you're of older age. That's really where you'd be sitting, but you might want to do the other things. You might not. You can see that it involves surgery if you need it. Um, you get transferred from site to site if you need it. Um, the level below that M2 looks very similar. The only difference is there's no site transfer. Um, and so often the patients that are in that situation are people that are already living in long-term care that wouldn't want to go to hospital or are living at home with fairly advanced disease and wouldn't want to go to hospital, but would like us to do what we can in terms of care in their home. And COVID is tricky, but certainly the, the community paramedic can go out and do a lot of things we would otherwise do in hospital in people's houses um, with M2 level of care. It's, it's tricky, you don't have a doctor rounding on you and going and seeing you every day, but there's a lot of things we can do um, with an M2 level of care, but there's not too many people that fall into that bucket in my experience. It's usually going to be M1 or, 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 or above or lower. If things are not great in your health in general and you're perhaps thinking, I don't want to be possible, I'm actually, I'm, I just prefer to be kept as comfortable as possible. I don't want someone trying to reverse things that are happening to me. Then maybe comfort care is for you. And you'll notice that it says here, can, can consider if required for symptom control. So the example I give there is your comfort goals at home, you fall over and break your hip, we will take you to the hospital, we'll fix your broken hip and we'll get you home again as soon as possible because that's a comfort measure, fixing a broken hip. C2 levels of care is for people when they're actively dying, but you'll notice that there's still a great end. There's still always something we can do. There is no withdrawal of care that people think about. There's always, always, always something that we can do. In fact, there's a lot that we can do to keep at the end of life. I think that's all I've got for that one. So next slide, please. Next slide, please, Meredith. Thanks. Um, so this is the where the decision point quite often falls for a lot of people. Do I want resuscitative care or medical care? And the thing is, you if you're looking at all comers, then it's different than if you're looking at people who already have a collection of health problems that are kind of ganging up against them. And we know that success of those aggressive measures is limited in those circumstances. I'm going to come on to that in a little bit. We need to try and help to understand what's my likelihood, what's your likelihood of success if we try and do these things. Uh, next slide, please. So CPR, I've done this more times than I care to count. Um, I've broken ribs in every single time that I've done it. Um, it's, it's, it's a pretty messy situation. And I'm gonna be honest, it doesn't work very well. If you're hospitalized with advanced disease. And what I usually talk about is what we're doing with medical care is trying to stop the train leaving the station. If the train leaves the station, our chances of bringing it back at that point when everything else we've done has not succeeded, our chances of being able to stop what was going, so the physiology that's getting ahead, it's pretty unlikely, unfortunately. So our success rates are not as good as the TV would lead you to believe. And we are going to post a decision aid online on the CBFP website as well. I'm not sure if that's there yet. Uh, Karen can uh, help us with that at the end. Uh, next slide. So this is a slide that one of our colleagues locally shared with us about how well it works. And so if you see that from this study, looking at surviving and leaving the hospital about 18% in the overall population. That's from, from birth to el the elderly. So your 40 year old that has a heart attack and is otherwise in pretty good shape is included in these statistics. If you're older, 
it doesn't look as good as that. And I'm not trying to be ageist, I'm trying to be realistic. Okay, and then people who've got serious illnesses like cancer, heart or kidney disease, so where their own physiology is already against them in some respects, we're looking at a 10% of surviving CPR. Notice it just says surviving CPR, not doing well, just actually getting uh, your heart beating again. How about if you've got critical illness and you're actually in the intensive care unit? If you have an arrest, if your heart stops while you're in the intensive care, things are already going pretty badly for you and they're doing everything they can to stop that train, but the train still left the station. So the outcomes there are very poor. You're looking at about 2% of them managing to get your heart beating again. And then an overall population over 75, this study talked about a 15% surviving CPR. But surviving CPR is not the be all and end all because we're also looking at neurologically intact discharge from hospital, having an extended period of downtime when your heart is not beating damages brain. Next slide, please. So what we'd really like to know about is, do we get you back to where you were before, which is at home with your family, which is where we'd like to, you to get to? Only a quarter are going to go home independently after a, C, a survival of a cardiac arrest in hospital. Another quarter are going to go home, but they're going to need some help. Half are going to end up needing to be institutionalised. So instead of going home, you're going to a, a nursing home. Next slide, please. So again, that brain damage that I'm talking about. So you survive, but half of the survivors are going to have some memory loss. They're going to have problems with just doing day-to-day -day things. They're going to be quite dependent on others uh, going forward, which again, if you're going from a very independent life, is it, it's hard to then change that. So we've, we've saved your life, but maybe we haven't really saved your quality of life. Next slide, please. So this is the Decision Aid um, booklet, which is available on the, uh, or where you find it. So if you go to the uh, COVID-19 part of our website, you'll find that. Um, I'm actually just going to go back one step about survival from uh, hot to hospital discharge. One second, I forgot to say this. So when I worked in Glasgow, I worked in Glasgow Royal Infirmary, and we had a lot of sick people. The data that we used when we were talking about uh, cardiac arrest. If you're over 80 and you have a cardiac arrest in hospital, so needing CPR, you have about a 5% success rate in terms of neurologically intact discharge from hospital. Someone else did a much more fun study. They had a lot of fun doing the study. They watched a bunch of TV and they watched a bunch of TV hospital dramas and they worked out what the success rate in those TV hospital dramas was, and it was 95%. This is a problem. You watch TV, you watch House, you watch ER, whichever uh, TV show floats your boat, they're both great, by the way. Um, and it makes it look like it works better than it does. In fact, it makes it the opposite of what, what is the reality. It is not a good treatment of advanced disease. If you're young and healthy, and something happens to you, we've got a reasonable chance of getting you back and getting you home to your family. But if you're not, our chances are poor. I've spent far too much time working in hospital and dealing with calls at four o'clock in the morning for people with advanced disease, and they, they don't do very well. And it, it's, it is rather sad. I think that might be my last slide. So next slide. And I'll pass it over to Julie. Hi everyone, I'm going to be talking about personal directives today. Um, so as Lynn mentioned, there's a little bit of uh, funny wording in Alberta around personal directives, um, where we talk about agents, which are people you name who you'd like to make decisions for you. So in a personal directive, you can choose an alternative decision maker to be your agent, um, which is the person that can make decisions if you are unable to. Also in this document, you get to write down any other information about your wishes and values related to your healthcare. 
Um, the personal directive only comes into effect if you're not able to make decisions about your health care. This can happen in a couple ways. One is two physicians sign off and say, hey, something's happened and this person is unable to make decisions. Um, or uh, some people have their loved ones uh, are able to activate the personal directive where it says, hey, this person can no longer make decisions. Um, and then other times uh, we get the government involved um, in order to make some of those choices. Um, so first, I'd like to just get into a little bit more about what are personal directives. Uh, so next slide, please. So the personal directive names the person you've picked to act on your behalf. Um, you can name one or you can name multiple. Um, if on your personal directive you name multiple and in between their names you write the word or, that means that one person or the other person makes the decision. And if you write and between the people's names, then all of those people need to make that decision together. So just a little technicality to keep uh, to keep in mind. And then um, a personal directive, uh, make sure that your written instructions are known in case something happens to you. So it can help your agent act on your behalf by giving them some information. Um, and it also helps your healthcare team know what your goals and your priorities are. Um, personal directives are optional and voluntary. Um, and they come into effect, as I mentioned before, if you're found to lack capacity. Um, so next slide, please. Um, so the next thing would be what kind of information should I include in my personal directive? Um, so in your personal directive, anything that is not finance related can be inclu included. So this would include medical treatments you would like or medical treatments you definitely wouldn't like. You can include information about where you'd like to live. You can include information about who you'd like to live with. Um, you can put information about who you would want to temporarily care for people you are in charge of. Um, the most common instance of that is children. Um, and then you can also include choices about other uh, personal activities, things like recreation or employment or education, um, and then any other personal or legal decisions. Um, you can't request anything illegal in a personal directive, though. Um, and then... Uh, as we've kind of mentioned throughout the, our conversation here with you guys today, the time to write a personal directive is now while you're healthy. Um, and that way you can have an opportunity to chat with your agent or agents to discuss and say, hey, here's what I'm thinking of. What do you think? And to kind of involve people you care about in the decision, because those are people that would probably be helping um, if ever the situation arose where we needed to use your personal directive. Um, if you don't have a personal directive, um, that means that you don't get to choose your agent. And so um, often your nearest relative will get to make the decision about you um, or family members and friends might have to go to court to become your guardian, which can take both time and money. Uh, in order to write a personal directive, um, the first step, like I mentioned, would be to talk to the people you'd like to make your decisions so that um, they can agree to be your agents and you can discuss your instructions and wishes with them. Um, and then the next step would be to write your personal directive. There's a variety of um, forms that are available online through the Conversations Matter website or through the Alberta government website. Um, and then once you've signed that document, it becomes a legal document and you can give out copies. You can keep copies in your green sleeve with your goals of care, the document that Dr. Johnson just talked about. Um, you can give copies to your agent, you can give talk to, um, copies to your doctor, and then anybody else who you'd like to be involved in the personal directive. Um, next slide, please. Um, and so now I'm gonna transfer it back to Dr. Siegel, who's gonna tell us a little bit more about how to make some of these decisions. Thanks, Julie. Um, so the next part of the presentation is a bit about making these decisions. So all of this information is probably overwhelming for some people. Um, and so some of you might have very specific ideas on what you want for your care and others might be really stuck. So Dr. Amy Tan from the University of Calgary has developed a handout about decision making steps to the same place uh, on our website. Um, and I'd like to ask uh, Drs. Yu and Gore Hickman to uh, walk us through what an example of this might look like. So if you go to the next slide there, Meredith. 
Great. Hello, everybody. So um, basically, these are these are quite difficult conversations to have um, and uh, require, you know, you and your families to do a little bit of thinking about what your wishes are. But um, essentially what uh, Dr. Gore Hickman and I are going to do is we're going to run through kind of a uh, example sort of um, uh, goals of care and advanced care planning conversation just to give you guys some idea of what to expect the conversation to look like from the uh, when, when you talk with your physician about this if you haven't already talked with your physician about this so uh, Dr. Gore Hickman are you with me I am here yes okay. and I will be Mrs. Smith uh, and we'll go through an example um, of what it would be like to call in uh, and chat with Dr. Yu, who will be my doctor in this example, um, of what the discussion might look like. Mm -hmm. All right. So, so I'm the doctor. I uh, give Mrs. Smith a call. Um, Mrs. Smith, hi, it's Dr. Yu. How's it going? Good. Um, I've been hearing more and more about uh, this advanced care planning, and uh, I, I was hoping that we could have a chat about that today. Um, and maybe we can set it to the next slide there, Meredith, and uh, chat a little bit about, yeah, what I'd like. Yeah, that's uh, great, um, Mrs. Smith. It's, it's actually funny. I was, I was wanting to talk with you about, um, you know, where, where things are with your health and where things might be going in the future. Um, as you know, uh, we're, we're having more advanced care planning conversations with patients, uh, especially during this time, just so that um, you're, you're, you're aware of um, the fact that uh, um, a lot of treatment choices are within your control and to give that control back to you and your families, just in case something happens. Um, obviously, God forbid, we don't want any, anything to happen, but just in case something happens, uh, we wanna make sure that you're in control of your own health um, at that time, and that uh, the health that we provide you as caregivers is compatible with uh, your wishes and uh, your goals for, for your life. Does that sound like a good idea? Absolutely. And, you know, I, I'm totally on board with this. I, uh, I do find it a little bit morbid to kind of talk about, but I can absolutely understand where, you know, I'm no spring chicken. And so I understand where, you know, I should be of sound mind now to make these decisions for my future. Um, so I know I'm seven years old. I've got diabetes. You know that I had that heart attack three years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, that in of itself, being in hospital was, you know, wow. That was that was an experience. And mm -hmm. and uh, yeah. So I, I'm happy that we're having a chance to be able to discuss this today. Mm -hmm. So I was going to talk with you first of all about your understanding of your illness, about the goals that you have for your healthcare about what your fears are, and also what some of the trade-offs in terms of your healthcare that you'd be willing to make. Now, it sounds like you have a fairly good understanding of your health already. Um, so I'm just curious now, Mr. Mrs. Mrs. Smith, uh, what, um, what are the most important things that you wanna do in life right now? You know, reflecting on my day to day, I would say one thing I really enjoy is playing with my grandkids, looking after them. We cook together, we go to the park together, you know, being able to play with them. I really value that. Um, I do walk every day. Um, first thing in the morning, it's one of my favorite things to do is just as everybody's waking up. And uh, and then I also enjoy playing bridge with my friends once a week and, and having kind of the mental capacity to be able to do that is, is important to me. Also because mm -hmm. I win a lot, so, you know. <laughs> mm -hmm. Understood, thank you for letting me know. Yeah, for sure. Um, what are your uh, biggest fears and worries about your health and about life in general? You know, especially after being in the hospital with the heart attack, um, I don't think I would wanna put my family through making these kind of, you know, decisions without some input from me first. Um, I just would never want to be in a position where, um, you know, I'm hooked up to all these machines and I'm not able to, you know, enjoy life with my family. Same thing from a mental standpoint, you know, I, I really like to be able to make those decisions for myself and be able to, you know, interact with my family and, and have that time uh, with my friends as well. And so that's something that I certainly value and wouldn't want to give up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I'm certainly hearing that um, you're, you're, you're very much also concerned not just about yourself, but also about your family in this. Um, is that uh, correct there? Mm -hmm, absolutely. Yeah, for sure. Understood. Now, 
this might be a bit of a difficult question, but have you thought about um, if you get sicker uh, in the in the unfortunate event of that, if if it was to happen, uh, what healthcare services would you be willing to endure for the possibility of more time with your family? So you know, I would still like to be treated with medication if I need it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, having CPR done, from what I've learned, I don't think that would be my best uh, management plan at this point. Um, I would still want to be able to walk and again, have those that mental capacity. And so, um, you know, I think going forward, I still do still want to ch chat with my family about their plans and, and, uh, and what I want. But um, yeah, I think that's where I'm sitting right now. I see. Meredith, do you mind moving to the next slide, please? Thank you. So, Mrs. Smith, um, just just because you bring up the, the the concept of CPR and getting care in an intensive care unit, um, you're you're absolutely right. I can tell you've been doing some thinking about this. Um, we know that um, uh, people who are sent to ICU and who um, have chest compressions and those sorts of resuscitative um, actions done on them typically. Um, uh, not all of them will end up um, being their normal selves once the whole process is over. And we know that at least half of them suffer uh, either one or a combination of uh, difficulty thinking, so neurocognitive issues, uh, physical problems that come, come from deprivation of oxygen to the brain and other sorts of mental issues as well. Um, but, but thank you for letting me know about what your, what your wishes are. Um, uh, if you would like, if, if you think um, that um, this is all the information that you would like me to know at this point, um, I'm happy to go ahead and start making some decisions with you now, if you prefer, that, um, that will tell us as healthcare providers what, to, what, what level and, and what extent of healthcare that we can provide you should something unfortunate was to happen. Um, keeping in mind that these decisions are not permanent, they can always be changed based on your wishes at the time. Um, but um, it, it, it only serves to help you be able to be in control of your, your, your care. Um, because if, if we don't get this done, then should something was to happen and you actually didn't want chest compressions, we'd be doing chest compressions on you anyway. Does that make sense? Yeah, that's clear. I, I mean, from what I've seen so far, I would probably stick with the, you know, M1, I think is my understanding at this point. Um, mm. But like you say, it, it's not set in stone. And I would like to chat with my family about that first and then and then absolutely um, confirm with you. But let's put that there for the meantime. Sure, for sure. So just as a quick pause there, Meredith, if you don't mind uh, moving on to the next slide. So we've reviewed Mrs. Smith's um, uh, goals and her um, wishes in life. Um, we, we obviously will do these things in a lot more detail when we talk with real patients, um, but uh, this is basically the gist of what we do as doctors. Next slide, please. And then also a key question that I'm not sure if you could caught me, me asking uh, Dr. Gore Hickman, Mrs. Smith was that if, if we were to get sick, what would be willing to go? What would we be willing to go through, for the possibility of more time? So, very very important questions to think about. Meredith, next slide, please. All right. So back in role play mode. Um, all right, Mrs. Smith. So we've talked about kind of the goals of care, which is what you want your healthcare providers to do for you, should something unfortunate happen. Now, what about in the other circumstance where you're not able to make up your um, you're, you're not in a position to be able to make medical decisions for yourself. Um, have you thought about who you'd be willing to have make medical choices for you? You know, I, I have a little bit. Um, you know, Bob, my husband, I mean, we've been married for 45 years and uh, we know that he tends to be a bit uh, more uncomfortable or, or distressed in, in more intense situations. Um, I do love him dearly, but uh, but we have our, our two children as well and, and with their grandkids. And so my two children, I mean, David, he lives in Calgary. He's a psychologist. He's always been very level-headed. Um, Cheryl, I mean, living in Okotoks, uh, she's an accountant and she's also, you know, um, 
you know, quite uh, suitable for this. But, but uh, in, in thinking, you know, we've had more open discussions with David, and I think uh, I'd, I'd probably leave it to him um, to help me with those. And Meredith, we can go to the next slide for that as well. Great. Um, thank you, Mrs. Smith, for, for the um, insight into your life. It certainly sounds like you have a very loving family and um, lots of good supports in your life. I can understand why you would want your husband um, to make medical choices for yourself and to be what, what we call a agent or a substitute decision maker for yourself. So it, it, it turns out that um, the way the Alberta government works and the legislation works around this is that if you don't write in advance who you want your surrogate decision maker to be, then the government actually acts as the surrogate decision maker for yourself. And you probably don't want that. And, you know, especially after what you told me. And it actually takes a fair bit of money to actually apply to the government to actually change the agent status for other people to be the agent instead of the government. It can take, it, last I heard was thousands of dollars and a lot of time, like weeks or months even, to get that agent status changed. So that's why we, we recommend to all patients to um, uh, uh, take a look at this green sleeve that I'm going to give you, which will include a template legal document, a basically a fillable advanced directive uh, that um, it's also known as a personal directive. Uh, that we can fill out together uh, in the presence of your husband and your children um, to basically legalize this and make sure the government knows that you have substitute decision makers chosen already and that they're legally able to give you advice or give us advice on how best to treat you should you not be able to make medical choices by yourself. Is that all right if we have you back and book, book you in for a separate appointment so that we I can go... That I think that sounds great. I'll get David, my son, to come in with me and we'll make sure we go through that form together. Perfect. All right. Um, so Meredith, if we want to go to the next slide, please. So in, in the meantime, Mrs. Smith, I would love it if you can talk with your family about uh, kind of the conversation that we had today, um, especially about kind of the, the goals of care that we decided and also the, um, the uh, the fact that we are going to be choosing your husband as a surrogate decision maker and that uh, our next appointment will be to, to, to fill out those documents. Is that all right? Sure. Although, yes, like I said, making sure that it's my son rather than my husband. Oh, sorry. <laughs> yeah. Oh my goodness. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> you bet. Yeah, you bet. <laughs> okay. All right. Yeah. So next slide, please. Yeah. So, um, so just a summary, Mrs. Smith has been thinking about her health and worries about getting sick, hasn't spoken yet to her family, but uh, we have set up uh, another meeting um, or we, she, she will set up a FaceTime meeting with her kids and her husband. And then we will set up another meeting to just document these things and um, make sure that they're written down. Uh, let's see. So again, um, next slide, please. Yep. So the next step is to just write them down, make sure that they're legal and signed. Next step, or next slide, makes an appointment with one of us, with your doctor, uh, and then you can get the forms uh, for these conversations at our website at cvfp.com um, under the COVID-19 drop-down under advanced care planning. So that is pretty much it, or are there any other, I think that's pretty much it for us, eh? Yeah, so Great. I've got actually uh, a couple of questions uh, that came through uh, by email. So thanks so very much, Drs. Gore Hickman and you. Um, Meredith, could you just pass it to the next slide, please? Thanks. Uh, there were two questions that I thought were really important uh, that came through by email. So these are paraphrased a little bit, but um, the first question is, what is the relationship between a personal directive and the recent right to die legislation? Uh, do you have to include your right to die wishes in the personal directive? So that's a great question. Um, as we've just covered, uh, the personal directive is, is meant to give decision-making capacity to another person, to somebody else, when you're not able to speak for yourself. So I think this question is referring to the medical assistance in dying legislation. And the way the legislation is right now, um, it requires that the person who is requesting assistance uh, be capable of making their own decisions at the time of the request and also at the time of death. Um, and so this is not something that would be included in the personal directive right now, although that's something that might change in future. 
I don't know if anybody else has any other comments on that. Uh, Meredith, if you can move to the next slide, please. This is another important question. Okay, uh, what are the chances of surviving and recovery after having to be intubated? Uh, in the case of COVID-19, is it a heroic measure or is it just the next step in the process towards healing? So as you know, COVID-19 uh, is an illness for which we do not have a cure. So our treatment is what we call supportive, which means we do our best to support your body while it's trying to heal. Uh, unfortunately for some people, this illness can progress to be quite severe uh, to the point of needing help with breathing and ultimately a ventilator. We don't have huge amounts of information about what this looks like in terms of outcomes, but we do have some data from Italy and China uh, that shows about one third of people who are put on a ventilator because of COVID-19 survive. Um, so this is likely impacted by things like other chronic diseases and age, um, but the numbers suggest that by the time someone gets to needing a ventilator, their chances of survival are not great. We also know that out of 100 people, 65 years and older, who require a ventilator for any reason, so not specific to COVID-19, about a quarter will survive to go home, about one third will die in hospital, and about 40% will survive with disability and not be able to go home, but need to live in some sort of facility like a nursing home. I wish that these outcomes were different, but in order to make good decisions about the care that you would like, it's important for you to understand what is likely to happen. Again, these are worst case scenario situations. And I just one, that the vast majority of people who get COVID-19 will have mild illness and will not require ICU or ventilator care. So this is about planning for a worst case scenario that is not terribly likely to happen. Could you go to the next slide, please, Meredith? Oops. Um, I think I wanted to pass it back over, sorry, but just before we get to the final thoughts, pass it back over to Dr. Johnson. I think there was a question or two on the chat that he wanted to address. Thank, thanks, Karen. Uh, so Dr. Reynolds is uh, moderating the chat for us as well, and she just sent me a, a screen capture about uh, what, what about the advisability of CPR and ventilation for those of the young old um, which uh, he's defined as uh, the 60-somethings. Um, so, so first of all, Tim Bits, I will say that uh, having worked in geriatrics, uh, you had to be over 65 technically to get onto my ward. Uh, and the reality was that most were over 80. So if you're in your 60s, you're, you're a young man. Had you asked me this question six months ago, I would have answered as follows. Why are you in the hospital? because it depends. So if you're in hospital and you have a cardiac arrest and you're on coronary care because you had a heart attack a couple of days ago, I'd say that your chances of survival are probably pretty decent. I can't give you a number, but basically you're surrounded by a team of nurses who are watching your monitor and they are on it the minute it happens. You've got fully trained staff able to then look for a reversible cause, which is, we already know what it most likely is, it's related to why you're there in the first place. But if you're in the hospital for other reasons, why are you in the hospital? So it depends. What we're looking for are reversible causes. And if there isn't a reversible cause, or we've been trying to reverse those causes with our medical care, and it hasn't worked, and the train left the station, as I talked about before, how likely are we to manage to haul that uh, train back at that point? Not very well. What about if you have a, a cardiac arrest outside the hospital? I would say it depends who's standing next to you when it happens. Do they know how to do CPR? And how far away is the nearest automatic defibrillator? Because that's what gives us good outcomes in terms of CPR is early, high quality CPR and early defibrillation with the machine. So not really answering your question, but essentially it depends on why you're in the hospital. But you've asked me this in, April 2020, when we're dealing with a world pandemic of COVID-19. I don't know, but I will. what I will share with you is that I've got friends working in hospital and critical care in the UK, and I've had conversations with them. They tell me that CPR is futile in the context of uh, COVID-19. It does not work. For all those reasons I've just said, if we've not managed to stop your heart from stopping with medical care, the chances of us restarting it again are, are, are poor um, and so the other problem is that you're also infecting the entire healthcare team who are trying to do CPR on that 
COVID-19 infected person. They are all wearing their PPR, PP, their PPE, but it is an aerosol generating procedure and you're potentially infecting all of those people. And so the concern is that we try and fix the unfixable and potentially take some of the some of the soldiers out in the process. I'm not sure if that does answer your question, but it's the best answer I can give you, I'm afraid. Thanks, Ian. I think that was a really great answer because it's not black and white. Um, so in, in final thoughts, we know this can be a really challenging topic for some people, but we'd encourage you all to think about your personal health situation and what you want for your care. So the doctors and their teams at CVFP are more than happy to have these conversations with you. And we'd encourage you to set up an appointment with your doctor to talk further about this. We're also doing some outreach to patients about this topic. So please don't be surprised if you hear from us first. Um, any final comments from the team on the, uh, on the call today? Great. Um, on that note- Can I, can I, add, one, can I add one thing out on, um, in addition to what Julie was saying about um, personal directives? Something I always talk about is um, there's a chap called Michael Schumacher. Now, Michael Schumacher was a, I believe he was a 41-year-old retired motor racing driver when he fell over and hit his head when he was skiing. Um, but because of his dangerous profession uh, as a Formula One world champion, he had all of his personal directives and various paperwork all done. Um, and I use it as an example to just show that you don't have to be elderly or with disease to need a personal directive. I'm 40. I have one. We should all have one. So if you're talking with your family about, the, about what you're going to do with your one, make sure they get theirs sorted out as well, because any of us can get hit by a bus. That's it. Thanks, Karen. Thanks, Ian. Uh, that's a great point. Um, I also have a personal directive, and I'm sure most of us on the call here today do as well. Yeah. Can I add something, Karen? Please do. Um, just the, the, I'm not sure that I heard this said at any point in time, but just so everybody is aware, you can change this any time. So personal directives can change and goals of care can change. So, um, you know, as your values may change in different stages of your life, you can make changes to your uh, advanced care planning documentation. So just keep that in mind. Okay, that's it. Thanks, Lynn, also very good point. I think that applies to both the goals of care and the personal directive when something changes is a perfect time to review these things. On that note, uh, I'd like to thank the CVFP team for participating in this information session today and to Dr. Richardson and I understand also Dr. Reynolds uh, for answering some questions on the chat line. Uh, thanks to our viewers for listening and we look forward to more conversations about this with you in the future. Take care everybody.